Well, hi there, boys and girls. Today we're going to talk about antiderivatives and indefinite integrals, which means that we are going to be going backwards. An antiderivative means we're going to undo a derivative. And I really like this chapter. It's a little more creative and challenging, um, but it, I view it like a puzzle. So I sort of like integrals a little bit. And let's start with this first question. If you were given that f prime of x equals 3x squared and you were asked what function f of x had this derivative, what would you say? Someone took a derivative of a function and they got 3x squared. So you would probably say that f of x was th uh, x cubed. However, could f of x been something different than x cubed? Could f of x look like this? How about x cubed minus 7? Take the derivative of x cubed minus 7, what do you get? You get 3x squared. Take the derivative of x cubed, what do you get? You get 3x squared. These are two different functions. We're going to look at graphically how they're different, but both of these functions have the same derivative. So when you do an antiderivative, you can't always be sure to get the exact function, but you can be sure on your powers of x. And we're going to say that f of x is called the antiderivative. That just means reverse derivative, going backwards, the antiderivative of f prime of x. The symbol, this squiggly little s symbol, which we'll find out this chapter where that squiggly little s came from, we're going to call that an integral. The symbol, the integral of g of x dx, this is like the comma x that we use on our calculator. It tells us our variable of integration. The symbol, this is the indefinite integral indefinite integral and you might understand why we would call it indefinite because of what we looked at with the very first question an integral would of 3x squared could be x cubed it could be x cubed minus 7 it could be x cubed plus or minus any constant the term indefinite integral is a synonym for antiderivative they mean the same thing indefinite integral is a synonym for antiderivative. Alright, so let's take a look at this chart. We had, we've spent um, a month, I think, on learning how to find derivatives of anything that was x to a power. We learned some trig derivatives. We learned all of these derivatives on the left hand side. Your integration rules need to undo these. They have to go backwards. So when we took the derivative of x to some power, our rule was, the power rule was, bring the exponent down and subtract 1. Well, if you're going to undo, multiply, and add, you have to go in reverse order. So we multiplied by that exponent, and then we added. How do you undo multiplication? Sorry, we did not add. We multiplied and we subtracted. We subtracted from the exponent. So how do you undo, multiply, and subtract? And you have to go in reverse order. Well, how do you undo subtract? You add. So instead of doing anything with this exponent, you're going to add 1 to the exponent. And then how do you undo multiply? You're going to divide. So you're going to add and then divide when you are trying to undo a derivative. And so that's why you get this rule right here. Also, you can see down here the rest of these integrals. They're supposed to undo the derivative. So if the derivative of sine is cosine, an indefinite integral should go backwards, so the indefinite integral of cosine gets you back to sine, so it's supposed to undo a derivative. So all of these are just basic integration rules that you're going to have to know through practice. Um, some properties of indefinite integrals, if you are integrating a, across a plus or minus sign, you just integrate the first function, and you integrate the second function, and you add or subtract them. Also, if you have a constant in front of a function, the constant can come out in front of the integral, just like it can with derivatives. And I want you to know that, unfortunately, there's no product rule and there's no quotient rule for integrals. There is no product rule, there's no quotient rule. So it's not going to be true when you integrate f times g that you can just integrate f and then just integrate g. Same thing for quotients. It's just not true, sad panda. Off we go for, for some examples. So here I have the integral of three separate functions being separated by a plus or minus sign. And so we're going to take them one step at a time. And we're going to integrate 3x squared. Now we already know from up here that the integral of 3x squared is going to be x cubed plus something. Let's use our rule, however. Let's take a look and see. If I have x to a power, how do I, f how do I find its general 
indefinite integral. And I'm going to add one to the exponent and divide by that number. I'll put the plus c at the very end of these three things. So my first step here is going to be 3x cubed divided by 3. What we've done is we took the exponent 2, we added 1 to that, and that's how I got this 3, and then we divided by that number. We'll simplify this in just a minute. Let's do the same thing to the 5x. I can imagine this 5x as being 5x to the first, so the antiderivative would be 5x squared over 2, and again antiderivative and indefinite integrals are synonyms, so I'm going to use them interchangeably. Now what about the integral of 4? Have you ever taken the derivative of something and just got 4? Well, yes you have. That would have been 4x. And then at the very end of this, we're going to put a plus c. So because there could have been some constant or something like that, um, that, would, that if we took the derivative of that constant, that would have gone away. So we don't know if there was a constant at the end of that or not. Okay, so I guess we can just clean this up and we're going to call this x cubed minus 5 halves x squared plus 4x and we're going to put this plus c placeholder at the end and what's nice about integration is that you can check your work if integration is supposed to go backwards from differentiation then you could take the derivative of your answer and if the derivative of your answer is the original question then you got it right so when you take your next test there's going to be questions that you either know you got it right or you didn't get it right um, so let's just figure it out. The derivative of x cubed, well, that's 3x squared. Well, that's good. What about the derivative here? If we bring the 2 down, those 2's are going to cancel, and I'll just have minus 5x. It's looking really good. The derivative of 4x is 4, and the derivative of any constant, even if it's pi squared, or if it's e, or if it's 75 billion, the derivative of that constant is 0. Hey, we got it right. Mr. G, don't you dare count that wrong, because I know for a fact that I'm right on that. Now, like I said before, there's not a product rule or a quotient rule for antiderivatives. So if you have a product, um, one thing that you might try is to actually multiply them together, especially if they're just polynomials. Go ahead and use your rules that you learned in Algebra 1. You learned again in Algebra 2. You saw it again in Pre-Cal. I don't want to hear you crying and complaining about the fact that you have to foil something together or box it or whatever you can do. So I'm going to rewrite this integral as the integral of 2x squared plus 6x minus 1x minus 3 and I can collect my like terms in the middle and I'm going to get the integral of 2x squared plus 5x minus 3. By the way, I'm curious how long it's going to take you guys to write the little integral symbol. That is not something that's natural to your hand to go, you know, to change concavity. It's, it's sort of neat that it's got a point of inflection in there. Um, but anyway, try, try it. Show me tomorrow when you walk into class. Show me your best integral symbol on my board. Um, so anyway, we're just going to go through here and use our rules. Uh, we've got x to some power, so I'm going to add 1 to that power, and I'll get 2x cubed. And then, of course, we divide by that, so 2x cubed over 3. And the, the antiderivative of 5x is going to be 5x squared over 2. And the antiderivative of 3 is minus 3x, and you better not forget you will lose a point if you do, a plus c at the very end. And of course you can go through here and check your work. Um, what if we have a quotient? There's no quotient rule, so I'm going to have to simplify this. I'm going to rewrite the square root of x as x to the one half. And I'm going to separate this into three separate functions, basically. So the x squared divided by x to the one half, of course you guys know to subtract those two, and two minus one half is three halves. So I've got x to the three halves minus 2x to the 1 half plus 7x to the negative 1 half. So if you have a monomial on the bottom, you probably want to go ahead and separate them. Now I've already told you on the video there's no quotient rule. Don't be that person that just takes the integral of the top and the integral of the bottom. I promise you you're going to be wrong. By the way, this is not equal to that. This is a separate little thing here. So if you've sort of stepped away to go grab a, you know, some chips or some popcorn or something like that. Don't think that those are equal. I'm doing a separate problem here. All right, so we're going to go through our rule. We're going to add 1 to the exponent and divide by that. And we'll, so what's 3 halves plus 1? Anybody? Anybody know what 3 halves plus 1 is? That's right. Very good. I think I heard Emma say that back there. It's 5 halves. And so we're going to get x to the 5 halves, and we're going to divide by that. Now, dividing by 5 halves is the exact same thing as multiplying by 2 fifths. You flip it over and multiply. So I'm going to get 2 fifths x to the 5 halves. 
minus, and I'm going to have, I'm going to add 1 to 1 half, which is 3 halves, so this is going to be an x to the 3 halves power, and dividing by 3 halves is the same thing as multiplying by 2 thirds. There's already a 2 here, so that's going to turn into a 4 thirds. Then when you add 1 to negative 1 half, what's that? What's, one, what's negative 1 half plus 1? That's a positive 1 half. I love answering my own questions. Dividing by 1 half is the same thing as multiplying by 2, but there's a 7 already there, so we're going to put a 14 right there. I think I just whistled through my teeth. And then plus C, of course. And if you forget the plus C, you're going to lose a point. And it's going to be several of you that do that, and I'll be sad when I do it. But anyway... All right, so we're going to go on. We're going to solve a differential equation. Boy, that's, that's a big word, differential equation. This simply means someone has taken a derivative, and they're going to give you the equation. You've got to go backwards and figure out what it is. So someone took the derivative of f. They found f prime of x was 6x squared. So we know that their f of x was some version of 6x cubed over 3, plus c, of course. And if we're going to simplify that to 2x cubed. So we know that f of x is 2x cubed plus some constant. Now, before we just left this as a plus c, but with this nice extra little nugget, this extra piece of information, this extra 411, I can figure out what the plus c was. This is a point on the curve of f. This is like an ordered pair 1 comma negative 3. I know that the x is 1 and the y is negative 3. f of x, of course, equals y. So f of 1 equals negative 3 means that negative 3 was the answer when we plugged 1 in for x. And we can now find out what c was. 1 cubed, of course, is 1 times 2 is just 2, so I still have negative 3 equals 2 plus c. Let's make sure that looks like a negative 3 and not like a chip. All right, and then we're going to subtract 2 from both sides. And I'm going to get that negative 5 is equal to c. Negative 5 is equal to c. And so my f of x is equal to 2x cubed minus 5. Now let's just check our work real quick. What's the derivative of this? What is f prime of x? Will it be 6x squared? There, that's good. And is f of 1 really equal to negative 3? When we plug 1 in for x, do you get negative 3 out for f of x? Well, 1 cubed is 1 times 2 is 2. Look at that. It worked. So there's your process. So if someone gives you a point on their curve and their derivative, you actually can find the exact function that they took the derivative of. So let's do this one more time with the trig functions. And I've got f double prime, and I'm, oh my gosh, I've got to get all the way back to f from f double prime. So we're going to go step by step, and we must travel through f prime to get back to f. So what would that f prime of x look like? What, what do you take the derivative of to get cosine? Well, we know that that's sine of x, but plus some constant c. And how are we going to figure that out? This little extra piece of information right here with that 411. We know that f prime of 0 is equal to 3. So 3 is equal to sine of 0 plus c. The sine of 0 is what? That's right, it's 0. So my c is equal to 3. So I know that f prime of x was exactly equal to sine of x plus 3. Now, to get back to f of x, I'm going to take the antiderivative of this. So f of x must have looked like the antiderivative of sine. What can we take the derivative of and get to sine? Well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. That means that I'm going to have to take the derivative of negative cosine to cancel those negatives and get back to sine. And then, what did we take the derivative of to get to 3? That would have been 3x, and then plus some constant c. How are we going to figure out the c? Looky there, they told me a point on f. f of 0 is negative 2. So negative 2 was negative cosine of 0 plus 3 times 0 plus c. So we plug 0 in for all our x's, and we plug in y for negative 2, and we've got to figure out what the c is. So negative 2 is equal to negative cosine of 0 is 1, plus c, and if we add one to both sides, we get that negative 1 is equal to c, 
And so we now know what f of x is. f of x is going to equal negative cosine of x. Ah, well that almost looks like a 5. Plus 3x minus 1. That's sort of neat. All right, let's deal with position and acceleration and velocity. This stuff is just not going away. So I've got a particle moving along the x-axis. We just took a test over this. And it's given I'm, my velocity equation is blah. And I have to figure out the acceleration function. We already know how to do that. The acceleration function is the first derivative of the velocity. And so that's going to be 12t squared minus 6t. Of course, the derivative of 5 is 0. So there's your acceleration function. That's, that's old news. Now what's new news is find the position function. The position function, s of t, is going to be the antiderivative or the integral of your velocity function. So we're going backwards, so we're going to take the integral of velocity to get back to position. So that means that s of t must look like this. 4t to the fourth over 4. Again, we add 1 to the exponent, and then we divide by that. I'll simplify that in just a minute. Minus 3t cubed over 3 plus 5t plus some constant c. And it says find the position function, so I need the real function. I need to solve for c, and I'm going to use this piece of information right here. At time t equals 2, the x-coordinate is 3. So, 3 is equal to, that simplifies to t to the 4th, so we're going to plug in a 2 for t. 2 for t, and t for 2. Sorry about that. I just came to me. Anyway, so we plug in a 2 for t. 2 to the 4th is 16. And these 3's cancel, and 2 cubed is 8. And then 5 times 2, where I went to school, is 10. And then plus c. So my last statement would be 3 equals 18 plus c. And so if we subtract 18 from both sides, we get negative 15 is my constant. So I know that my position function is equal to t to the fourth minus t cubed plus 5t minus 15. That's pretty neat. I will see you guys tomorrow.